Bontada, soy la señora Agnes Benengeti de Jorona. Um, I'm from the West Kingdom currently. I've lived in uh, Principality of Sanagua and the province of Silver Desert, which means I'm in the back of beyond of the West Kingdom, as almost as east as you can go and still be in the West, but not quite. There's a one or two branches uh, just past us. Actually, only one, if I remember right. I think we gave our other one away. Um, for those not familiar, uh, that is the modern confines of Reno, Nevada in the United States. Folks in Northern Nevada will tell you we are so not Vegas, though we still have gambling and shows, um, but seriously, we're close to San Francisco, closer to San Francisco than we are Las Vegas. The joke up here is that Las Vegas is Los Angeles East and never, ever, ever say Nevada. It's Nevada. Okay, so here's our plan for today. We are gonna, uh, I've, I've done my introduction, so we've, we've done that. We're gonna be discussing what is a culture, what is lasis, or as in Spanish, Maya, um, what is catalogo de anjas in casas, I forgot to, I forgot to correct the spelling on that, sorry, casas, um, and then the discussion of figure 186, which is the culture. I'm working on some tutorials for Lasis, but we will not be working on any projects today. This is just a discussion on the way you can use an extant piece to create your recreation. Okay. Also, we won't be discussing every panel. There are a lot of them, and we don't have time to talk about each and every one. Yeah. Um, if there is a question, please type it into the chat. Um, make sure your mute is off. Um, so that we can keep the bandwidth down and we can move through this fairly quickly. Yeah, Agnes, okay. it's showing yeah. your, your primary and your next animation um, slide. Oh, are you? Oh, shoot, because I'm not getting that. Yeah. Oh, let's see. It's fine. Everybody can read it. It's just we get to see your notes too. So, <laughs> okay, let me see if we can reshare it. There we go. I don't want that one. I want this one. There we go. Better? Correct. Yes. Perfect. Okay, good. All righty. So next up. Okay. And then, of course, at the end, we will have questions. All right. So this is the textile we're talking about. It is called A Culture by um, Professora Maria Angeles. Gonzalez Mena, and please forgive my Spanish pronunciations because my, despite the as as Duchess Juana says, despite the fact I'm born and raised in Southern California, I my Spanish is really sucky. Um, so um, basically, what this is, uh, I went too far on my notes. There they are. Okay. Um, the direct translation uh, in modern Spanish is quilt. Okay, this is our cult. It's, um, but as you can see, it, if you're, uh, it's got patchwork elements to it. So I guess that would be, um, I, I don't know exactly why they would call this a quilt per se, um, but it is, you know, because by the American idea of a quilt, I don't know, um, you know, I don't know how Europeans view these, um, but it is a bed cover, okay? It is a bed cover of some, of, you know, a, a nice little bed cover, okay? Um, so that's probably, Colche is probably closest to uh, what they would call it in that, or at least in 1970s uh, Spain. Um, I may have to take my, I'm taking my headgear off because I'm, I don't know about you guys, but I'm hearing a lot of jingle dangling, so I'm gonna take my head gear off. Because if I can't talk without causing jingle jangling, um, you guys don't need to hear it. Um, so uh, basically, it's a decorated be bed cover, okay? Uh, now, there's a fun fact in 18th century New Mexico, the colonists used to mend their blankets and quilt with an embroidery style that is commonly referred to as colcha embroidery. Um, it's an embroidery style that is similar to the cluster stitch that we see in 13th and 14th century Germany. Um, it's a self-couching technique that uses wool threads to create cartoons. Um, so it's kind of cool to think that this goes back to that stage. Um, 
what is, so now our next point is what is La Cesar Maya? Here you can see a um, piece that I did from Vinciola, um, which is an Italian pattern book. Um, it's a needle lace that's constructed on a knotted, uh, a net or a mesh, okay? Uh, humans have been using nets for all kinds of things, so it's no surprise they decided to use a net for decorative yet practical purposes. There have been decorative nets that go back into the 13th and 14th century, possibly before then. Most of the extant decorative, decorative nets I've seen um, are those from period, are, that are from period, are German and English hair nets. Um, there's a reliquy bag that goes back to around the 13th century that also has a layer of decorative net. This one is also believed to be German. Swain's book on Mary Stuart shows, a, you know, Queen of Scots, shows a piece of Lassis attributed to the ill-fated queen who was, caught, uh, who was taught needlework by Catherine de' Medici, her mother-in-law, when she was being raised in the French court. Um, in Calago de in Casas, they have several pieces of lace. Most are from the mid to late 16th century. Now, I don't want folks to be confused with burrato. Burrato is also a decorative lace done on a woven, but it's done on a woven mesh, not a knotted mesh. That's how you tell the difference between the two, uh, essentially, is one will be on a knotted net. And if you look closely at the little net, you will see all the little knots in the net. Um, Barato is an Italian form that's believed to be, you know, um, that's, but Lassis is daintier than Barato. Um, Lassis is made using mostly uh, linen stitch, which is kind of you, you weave through your net and then you weave back and you use a pattern that is very similar to a cross stitch pattern. And my notes have gotten out. Oh, no, it didn't get out of line. Okay, so the book we're working with is, um, come on, don't make, okay, so we kind of talked about it. Um, the book we're working with is Catalogo de Encajes, um, and it's from the Instituto Valencia de Don Juan. Um, it is a, what is going on? Oh. They're all my no Sorry guys, my notifications came up. Um, come on, go away. Go away, you thing. Go. Don't give me problems. Um, what is Catalogo de Encasa? Okay, so it is a um, book of, well, laces. It's a catalog of laces for those who don't speak Spanish. Those who speak Spanish, um, they definitely know exactly what it is. Uh, it, and if you notice, there's a piece of Lassis on the front uh, cover of the book. Um, the book is from Instituto Valencia de Don Juan, which is a museum in Madrid that contains luxury goods. And evidently, they have several books that they, several catalogs of different aspects of their collections. I'm trying to slow down so I'm not like running out of air and everything. Um, they have several, you know, they have ceramics, they have paintings, they have pictu um, what else do they have? Manuscripts, books, um, all from, you know, the Middle Ages on up. Um, this one is, as you can see at the, underneath the title, um, it has the addition of Con una adición la, al catalogo de bordados. That was the book I was trying to buy when I bought this one. Um, was the Catalogo de Bordados, and I do have that one now also, which both are really awesome books to have because they, we're not talking, um, we're not talking uh, church goods. We're not talking like altar cloths and dalmatics and the things that would be worn by the cat in the Catholic Church or used as part of the communion services. We are talking home goods, home luxury goods. Everything in these books are home luxury goods. So it's kind of a neat thing to, you know, to be able to read. Unfortunately, I think the last, um, I managed to get this uh, about five, 10 years ago. 
Um, I'm very glad I got it when I did because now it's getting really expensive. Okay, so now we're going to get into the real fun part. Let's see. We're going to start kind of discussing the culture itself. I have provided you with the Spanish. So if you uh, read Spanish, you can go ahead and read that. Um, I do have translations um, that I will be putting um, I'll be putting up, I haven't quite figured out where yet, probably on uh, SCA Iberia. Um, so here is our culture again. You get to see it again. Um, the and, and this is the description that starts on page 353. This is figure 186, and you can see the Spanish description, you know, I already said that, um, but you know. Um, I was able to trans get create a translation in English of what is being said with assistance. So I did have to call in assistance. Actually, Google Translate is your friend, but there are some things it just doesn't want to help you with. Um, this is a singular specimen made up, and from this is direct quoting what we translated. This is singular specimen made up. Uh, 42 large squares of mesh united by rectangles of fine homemade white linen at the intersections of these other smaller mesh squares are inserted in the manner of floor tile patterns. The large squares present a part of the works of Hercules completed with some of the famous legends of their mythical history. In the passages, the hero makes use of the mace as if it were a magic wand, since it always appears to you, you know, when he's using the mace, it always appears luminous flashes in its widest part or head. In some panels, he has a beard and in others not, generally short curly hair. The panels do not follow a, regular, regular, a rigorous order of events, but rather mix and match capricious capriciously as if they had been related by an educated mind and a skillful hand would have carried them out and united them later without keeping chron chronological fidelity. So the footnote mentioned that the small squares of net in this, all those little little squares, um, feature uh, rabbits, owls, eaglets, eagles, dogs, griffins, hawks, pigeons, lions, symmetrical trees with two or four branches, peacocks, uh, peacocks with eyes, monkeys, owls, etc. Um, although they could well represent in general um, the way the simple fact of having encountered a whole series of animals throughout their journey through various countries and nevertheless some of them express uh, uh, some of them express it's a two-pager sorry guys uh, express themselves clearly in some of their passages. In the last work the figure of um, Asikopoulos intervenes, imprisoned under the weight of a huge rock for having set that Persephone. That does not match. Where did that come from? And some of their passages. Okay. Her uh, Heracles, okay. Oh, the owl that is used in the last, sorry, I had to reread this. Um, the owl that was, um, that was, used for the last little tile which is really hard to see because of the way that this, this is the best scan i could get um i'm finding though that if i put it on my tv i can see the at least the shapes of the little the little uh um tiles um but anyways it basically so each of these little tiles features a different animal the last one being the owl that um Demeter had turned into, or had turned Ascolophus into after Hercules released him from hell because he had been put in hell because he's the one who told Demeter that Persephone had, he, he told on Persephone. Persephone ate the pomegranate seeds and he told on Persephone, which meant that Persephone had to live in Hades for six months. So, you know, you know, uh, what is the, the saying they have um, that, uh, that, um, squealers get um something about coffins or something i can't remember uh, i'm sure somebody can remember that uh remember where they're they're doing it okay anyways the 
I hate when I can't remember my sentences. Anyways, there's a possibility that um, one of the things that's mentioned in a second footnote is the possibility that an educated woman created these panels, but was for some reason unable to finish them, and another person would have done the finishing work. They may have been trying to maintain the dimensions to the bed cover and not knowing the history of the myth, they didn't pay attention to the order of the story. Also, there is repetition of some panels and inclusion of things that are not related to the history of uh, Hercules. This is confirmed when we bear in mind that there are some works to represent. It's very likely that the images for the pattern were taken from existing series of graphics from an earlier illustration book or manuscript. The embroiderer lace maker would have made some variation in order to simplify the characters or elements since the geometric technique of the lace does not allow the detail that the original graphics present. Um, so we are seeing a um, one of the things of Lassis, the use of Lassis, is that it's kind of like cross stitch or needlepoint, um, where generally if you're using things like ten stitch, you're not going to get a lot of rounded, you know, detail is not easy to get in these, in these things. They have a lot of detail, but it's very difficult to get the detail. Um, before I move on, do we have any questions? Okay. Zada, there are no questions in the chat right now? None at all. Okay. Well, hopefully you guys haven't fallen asleep already. Okay. Oh, oh, there's a question. There's a question. Oh, there's a question. Okay. Where and when was this original form? Where and when was this original form? Um, are we talking the the culture or are we talking La Cisse? And then they said about how many stitches per inch on this one the culture we're looking at. Okay, we will get to that <laughs> as we go along. Um, we will be to hold that question. Hopefully I answer it. Um, this is the only detail of one of the small tiles. And I wish I could get better details of some of the others because I have found that this is a really good, um, it's really good to use it for a uh, practice piece for when you're teaching uh, Lassis because it is very period. We have the late 16th century um piece right here in front of us it's very period um and it you know and, and who doesn't like a peacock okay if you live next to a flock of peacocks you may not like them because they do like to get up early in the morning and and tell you about their lives um so looking at this um if you look at the border itself uh the lessis is done in a flower pattern that is using a darning stitch and variants on Punto de Espiritu um, and a few other stitches. Um, I do get a lot of, um, so Catalago de Casas um, does have the, um, does have the stitches um, with their, the names that they're used in Spanish. And so I've been kind of looking at what they have and then going into Dilmont's book, Complete Encyclopedia of Needlework, to figure out what, she, how, what she's calling it. Because um, in, this, in this particular case, it's really kind of hard. Most of the Lassie's books I have, they're dealing with very basic how to do linen stitch. You know, you weave one way, and, you know, you go left to right, weave, 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 weave back, and then go right or up and down, weave, weave, weave through every, all the threads instead of weaving through the mesh, now you weave through all the, the other threads um, to create the linen stitch. And if you look at the, the piece that's in front of you, you can see how it just looks like fabric, okay? These, on the other hand, they're, they've got a little bit of, um, you know, they're, they're lines, they're very fine lines. Um, those are being done using a darning stitch, which is 
pretty similar, except for instead of darning with, you know, going, weaving one way and then weaving back and then weaving up and down, you're only weaving the one way and back. I guess that, I hope that makes sense. Um, there's also a variance of that. Um, if you look at the different flowers and stuff, um, you see some things that look kind of a little bit like a buttonhole stitch or something that are being used. We do know that they do use a buttonhole stitch on the edging. Um, the, you know, so that, you know, the buttonhole stitch is a, it gets used a lot. So let's discuss patterning from a period source. So we're going to create a pattern. Um, first thing you got to do is choose your object. Well, with this particular culture, you have like thir uh, 42 to choose. Um, or, you know, if you're playing with the whole book, you have the repostaro that I'm working on currently. And I did it this for the nice clean picture. Um, because it's a, a nice clean picture that you can look at and kind of see up uh, up on top. I've made my copy of the original panel that I want to redo, and then down below I have gridded it out. In this case, I'm using a ten square. You know, it's um, you know one tenth inch squares. So every ten, every one inch square has ten, or essentially a hundred squares in it. Um, you know, uh, I will admit being a silly American, I use inches mostly. Um, I'm thinking I may need to go to metric, but I'm not really sure because I can't remember when they started the metric system. But um, the, the pieces themselves, the textiles themselves, are in metric, uh, the, the little bit we have. Um, as of right now, I believe that this is, um, almost all of these are being done 10, uh, you know, 10, um, mesh, 10 mesh, which is 10 squares to the inch or something close to that. Uh, if you get any smaller, it's really hard to make the net and you really can't buy net that's below seven. Um, you know, we have here, you know, we make the pattern. So it, um, this one is really a nice one because this is one that I made using a cross stitch pattern or a cross stitch generator, a patterns generator. Um, unfortunately, when I started changing computers and stuff, I lost the pattern and I, the pattern uh, programming, and I can't make them this way anymore. It was so much easier than uh, taking a pencil and grid paper. <laughs> it took forever uh, to do the eagle. Um, but here is the one that I took from, um, from the, the culture that we're talking about. My girl Lu Luna. Um, Luna, La Luna, uh, the color, the color is high. Okay, I use highlighters like I use them when I do cross stitch patterns too. Um, it's counted work. Highlighters are your friend. They can they can tell you where you've been. Um, and we'll be t discussing her a little bit later. Um, so if you can afford the gridding pattern, I recommend it highly. Uh, this one, uh, Luna was gridded on a five per inch grid. She is huge. I would suggest definitely getting a 10 per inch grid um or something equivalent in you know but um otherwise you know so 10 inch grid you can do with a pencil very easily um make uh make a copy of your pattern um and or like scan it into your computer so that you have it for posterity even if you have to like enlarge it or do something make a pattern uh you know make the pattern but so does everybody understand this process or have I just like lost you completely looks like so far so good okay all righty so let's look at some of the panels here we have the story of caucus um, this is this is the first and second panel in the culture um, these are repeated uh, about 
like two or three times, if I remember right. On the, you know, the panels have been repeated a couple times. Um, so this one I would have approached from the void when I when I'm patterning, I would approach it from the voided space. The, the space that you can see the mesh is voided. That's your voided space. Okay. When you look at Vinciola, um, you find that it's really hard to try to go in the actual pattern and grid it out from the pattern. If you look at the voided space, that's where your squares are. So make use of them. <laughs> you know, that's where you're going to be counting from. You may need to have a ruler or a straight edge available to you so that when you get into those internal uh, spaces, you can, um, when you're stitching or you're doing those internal spaces, you can try to approximate where those little voids are, you know, like the, um, the part where his arm is coming down as he's grabbing the cows from the herd that Hercules was pasturing and while Hercules slept, the bandit or monster, depending on who you, which story you read, um, grabs the the um, grabs the cattle by its tail and he dra and he marches them backwards so that it looks like the cattle is going the other direction. I don't know why they always thought this plan would work, but evidently they thought so. Um, it's this is mostly linen stitch, but you do see some of that darning stitch, like in the, ta the tails of the cows. Um, there is that darning stitch. And in his name, his name is done in, it looks like it's done mostly in, um, it's geometric enough that it, it's coming in um, as the darning, the linen stitch. Now, here is where Hercules gets his revenge on Keiko or caucus um, in English, uh, and you know, basically takes his mace and bashes him in the head and kills him. Um, and you can see in this panel, yeah, the, the, um, these aren't Victorian needlewomen. They are not doing pretty sweet pictures. Um, but you can see that they use darning stitch in the, in the lettering of Hercules's name. Um, that on the star point of the mat, you know, the magic wand mace, you know, his magic wand mace. And then, you know, a little bit on the leaves, the hair of Cacus, um, and the, um, and the, the roots of the tree. The description, um, so these are our first two panels and we're looking at them. We know what we need to do. Um, and it repeats several times. Uh, the first two panels are from the history of Hercules and Caucasus, is what it says. These two pictures present the story uh, adventure with the bandit Caucasus. In the first box, Caucasus leads the oxen that he had stolen from Hercules. In the second, Hercules kills Caucasus by taking revenge on him and recovering the oxen that he had stolen from him. There is a sense of perspective in the back arch, which represents the cave that Caucasus stashes the cows. There are two inscriptions that say Caco and Caco Hercules. Okay, so most of the descriptions of the panels themselves is pretty much just telling the story or how these panels relate to the story of Hercules. Okay, so here we have our Un Caballero. Um, it's the third panel. It doesn't seem to be part of the storyline or within the theme. However, with the description, Professor Menya suggests a possible connection. This panel is repeated in uh, panel 21 and panel 27. Um, so the English uh, linen stitch, oh, uh, linen stitch appears to cover all but a small portion of the pattern. If you look at the feathers on his hat, um, that looks to be the darning stitch, and his fingers look to be darning stitch. So, you know, but the rest of it is pretty much just going straight forward. Um, however, his hair has a little bit of a curl to it, so that might be uh, a variation on darning stitch. Um, linen, 
Okay, so in English, basically the panel says, in this panel is a gentleman dressed in the style of the time of Philip II and wearing a cap adorned with feathers. It appears that he is leaning out of a window or lattice lookout, although it could be also be a theater box from where the character is witnessing the production of the works of Hercules. We don't always think about um, those of us who have been um, raised with anglicized history, we tend not to think of the Spanish as being um, people who would watch theater for some weird reason, but you just don't think of that. Um, and yet, you know, there was Cervantes. Okay, my next one, I love this one. This one's very intricate, that's why I picked it, because it's kind of intricate. It's a good mix of linen stitch and darning stitch. Both stitches weave through the net to create delicate leaves and stem. This panel repeats as number 24. Um, the, the, sto the, yeah, the stuff up here on the screen uh, in Spanish, uh, the English for that, <laughs> sorry, brain fart. Um, the story says, this panel represents the story of the Kyrenean, Cyrenian, Kyrenean hind, or basically a hind is a female deer for those who don't know, in a calm and resting attitude. Legend has it she was very fast and did not leave Hercules alone for a year until he finally caught up with her, wounding her, okay? Um, this just my little note on this third task. This is the third task of Hercules. The hind was the pet of Artemis, the goddess Artemis, aka Diana, and Eurystheus, the king who was setting Hercules on his tasks, his 12 tasks, uh, was hoping that the goddess would punish Hercules for stealing her deer. But Hercules was able to negotiate with Artemis, and she was like, okay, you know, take the deer as long as you return it, and which it, it was returned in a manner of speaking, but that's another story. Let's go to the next. Come on, baby. There we go. Oh, now here is the one for your heraldry friends, okay? If you want to make them something that's really period, but like shows off their heraldry, this panel is for them. Um, has nothing to do with the story of Hercules. I'm going to tell you that right now. Has nothing to do with the story of Hercules. Um, however, it is very complex. It's lovely. Um, it uses linen stitch and lots of darning stitch in different ways um, to get the cross swords and the mullets and the round, you know, which are the little round things. Boy, I had fun trying to uh, get that one. It was like back and forth between um, Nieves uh, and I on how to get that done and, or how, what that was. And so she would be sending me pictures of Spanish heraldry. So um, according to the, um, the Spanish, uh, that says this panel is filled by heraldic shield with cross edge, cross blade edges, alternating with mullets or rounds, as, you know, those are the rounds. Um, my husband is a uh, heraldry Greek geek, and so he, he says, they're mullets. I'm like, okay, they're mullets. Um, in, it, it's, uh, in its field, a rider has been registered carrying a pennant or banner. That was another one that was giving us problems. On a galloping horse that is harnessed with beautifully brocaded barding. The banner um, has noble insignia with 13 mullets occupying the entire field of the shield, okay? Um, the footnote says there are three families whose arms match those on this shield. These correspond to the Sarimianto, uh, which is red with 13 mullets of gold, Velasquez, blue with 13 white mullets, and Bustamante gold with 13 blue mullets. Um, the, the colors come from me, not from her. Um, the Sar, uh, Sarmiento have no, the nobility based on ancient legends, which place it in the time of Alfonso VIII. After the Battle of Arlarcos, many knights having died, the orphan children were collected for their education and care in a center instituted for this purpose. When one of these children was presented to the king, he exclaimed, 
good Sarmiento. I have no clue, according to Google, that is good shot or good shoot. So if you, anybody know what that one is? <laughs> but what the English for that would be? <laughs> um, I don't think it's good shoot. Um, if possible, but I doubt it, you know. Um, any questions so far? Um, you had... Um... Constanza says you lost her at a little on the grids, but she'll talk to you later. And then Leah says Victorian needlewomen. It is, it, that's a question? Yeah, she's like Victorian needlewomen. Um, oh, okay. Um, in, Engl uh, in English society, Victorian needlewomen would be uh, women who are from the 19th century. The reign of Queen Victoria the First of England. And okay. that's it so far. So so far. Hopefully, hopefully I've I've explained well. Um, I'm sorry. I tend to like uh, tend to refer back to things from a uh, Anglo Anglo American. Um, and then History. she goes, are these squares made in the Victorian era? No. These are uh, 16th century. Felipe dos. Felipe dos. Um, late 16th. Okay. okay. Hold on one moment. I got to turn on the light because it's starting to get dark here. The sun has moved. Um, so the sun, it's not going down yet. It's late afternoon here in Reno, which is in the west, western part of the United States. Uh, okay. And then another question popped up on this okay. particular slide. They see the Sarmiento as the family name and Sarmiento as the exclamation, any relation. Right. That's what it is. But according to the, to my translation, it's shoot. Whatever that means. But okay, well, thank you. Um, so we'll figure that out. You know, Okay, so we have here, I like this one too. It's another one of those that has a lot of complex things going on. Ooh, I just noticed that. I just noticed the owl. <gasps> I could use that in a small one. Oh, well, anyways, back to work. Okay, quit getting distracted, Dolan or Viney. Okay, um, I, chose not to, I chose to use this one because it's use of different stitches to create this battle scene. Hercules with his mighty star mace. And in the water is the river god Achaelius. Uh, that's the English for it. Uh, um, Aquilo is the, or Aglo, Aquilo is um, how it came out in Spanish. Um, in the water is, you know, he's the river god. The use of linen and darning stitches to create waves. I just love how they use the darning stitches in the, the uh, that whole pattern. I'm like looking at this one going, ooh, I may have to do this one now and pattern it. Um, let's see. So this panel refer, and you know, now to what we have here. This panel refers to the personification of the river. Um, in the lower right corner, the waters are represented by wavy bands alternating wide and narrow, contrasting light and dark, or um, the actual translation that came through was chiaroscuro, which is an art term I found out. It's like I'm learning. Um, it's actually, you know, it's an art term. It's uh, Italian based. Um, but that's what Google Translate put out there. And I had to go look on, you know, Google it and found out, oh, okay, it's just saying, it's just a fancy term. Um, but not movement because the uniformity of the waves produces stillness. So because they are, you know, I mean, that's what I got out of that translation. So you, you take it as you want. 
Above them emerges an adult bust with curly bearded hair. Next to it is the inscription, you know, Aglo or Ake, you know, it's, it's Aculus is the English translation. Um, Hercules appears young, beardless, with rather straight hair, which they probably got using the, uh, the, um, darning stitch. That's the word I want. The inscription, uh, determines more than angrily, and he's determined to cross the water. Um, the inscription must be read from right to left because the painting is placed inside out. I have a feeling that when they did, took the picture, um some either in the developing of the photo or the printing it got flipped again um so because we're looking at it and it's the correct direction but i guess when you have the the culture on the bed it's the wrong direction um it undoubtedly represents hercules and achaeus the god and personification of the river son of the ocean and of Tethys and father of the sirens, according to the narrative of the mythology. And then it's signed, of course, it has the, the two words. Okay, so the next one, this is a beautiful one, okay? Um, let me, oh, no, wrong way. There we go, let me say, this one is just beautiful. This is Leon. The neckline of this lion is using a variant of the Punto de Espiritu stitch or an interlocking lace stitch. Uh, according to de Delmont, um, who in 1886 uh, wrote her little treatise on neo-work that's been translated into English. One thing I'm finding is that the alternative stitches do not follow the examples, and I do have to guess, you know, so I'm guessing based on the portion of the displayed picture, uh, you know, examples in the books, I, I have to guess that this is some form of the darning stitch, but it has been, uh, it's an interlocking lace stitch that's on that mane. If you look at the mane, it has all the little waves going. Okay, the rest of him is mostly uh, done in our, uh, our friend linen stitch. There are a few areas like his tongue that could be, yeah, anyways, I'm not sure. Um, well, yeah, probably is uh, linen stitch. So his tongue is linen stitch. But you can see little bits, you know, wherever there is a spot that needs a very fine line, they're using the um, darning stitch, okay? Um, this is a classic example of that. Punto de Espiritu has several more steps to meet the full usage of the stitch. This is just repeating the first segment of the stitch um, over and over and over to create the main. The motif is used again in panel 19, but it's been flipped. So while one lion looks one way, the other lion looks the other way. Um, the, the, um, and I was working with, um, with uh, Nieves Rico Pereña on the translation of this page and we were like okay she's waxing poetic about this lion but really there's not much useful to say about this other than she says a large crowned lion appears in this painting with a blooming tail does that look like a blooming tail to you my husband thinks it might be some kind of variant on a heraldic term for the tail um but a blooming tail and powerful claws. The expressiveness of the animal is great in a solemn attitude. With safe and accurate, I do not know why Google Translate, I put it in parentheses on my translation, Google Translate put raisin. In my mind, a raisin is a dried up grape. That's what we call raisins. They're dried, you know, they're dried grapes, dehydrated grapes. You're at the 15-minute mark. Okay, so we will go through this very quickly then. Um, so it's an air of triumph, beautifully overlapping mane. So what I'm going to do now is basically just go through these really quickly, okay? Because I want to have time for people to ask questions. All right, so here we have Claudio Ptolemy. Um, despite his um, contemporary or uh, like 
old contemporary costume. This is referring to Claudio Ptolemy of the first century, first and second century. Um, he was an astronomer um, and a geographer. And he's very famous for these. Um, this is a really nice panel to do, um, to, to work on. And so mostly it, the thing that is, strikes me is this is when there, is, there are only a few, a handful of panels that are done all in lacis or in uh, linen stitch. And this is one of them, okay? The next one is, um, is Neptune. And again, you know, he is one of those, he's done in just linen stitch, which makes me wonder if maybe the person who did these two plus uh, three others were or was not as skilled as the person doing all the others. So this may have been one that was done by the finisher. It's possible. Um, there are two that were not, you know, I wasn't planning on showing, Vanity and Punishment of the Concubine. Um, but I do love this panel because it's, well, Neptune. He's my guy. Um, I may, be, may have been born under Aries, but I love the water. Okay, so next we have My Girl. If you're going to let me do it. Oh, please say you didn't. Come on, My Girl. What are you doing? Hold on, guys. Um, here we go. This is my girl. This is Luna. Um, Luna my husband's going, Luna. Okay, La Luna. La Luna. Um, it's entirely done in linen stitch. However, the panel has several elements. When I did this panel, I found it best to do each motif individually. Counts were tricky and did a lot of unstitching in huge areas. I love her though. Um, this painting is dedicated to the, or painting panel is dedicated to the moon as a female figure crowned with two horns. It is the crescent symbol of Artemis or Diana. A scepter in the left hand and on the, uh, on the right, the symbol of the full moon with kings and remembering one of their denominations, the brilliant Selene. Selene is a titan. Next to the symbol is quarter moon, the waning crescent, which could also represent Selene. Um, two scorpions guard them. On the right side of the figure, there are two earth spheres that simulate the two hemispheres at the top of the inscription. It says Luna. Um, note, okay, one thing that uh, Professor Gonzalez Menya is not mentioning is the head dripping in blood. Um, that's Orion. Um, the Orion upset Diana Artemis due to a bit of sexual harassment. Uh, depending on which story or you, you hear, Orion either kept hitting on the goddess herself or her handmaidens, the Pleiades. Um, she sicked her scorpions on him. There, notice the two Scorpios, scorpions. Um, again, depending on the story, either Zeus or Apollo, uh, Orion was a drinking buddy of Apollo's, um, takes pity on him and places Orion in the sky as a constellation. Now, being a jerk, Zeus put Pleiades in the sky in front of Orion, so Orion is constantly chasing, uh, you know, Artemis's girls. I mean, he is, you know, Zeus was a bit of a, a, a well, I could use a word in Spanish, but the, the Spanish word I know is really, really bad, so I won't. Um, <laughs> but it starts with a P. Um, and uh, so he did that, and so that Orion could chase the girls for the Pleiades for uh, the rest of eternity. Um, but La Luna, depending on the stories, um, put the Scorp put Scorpio in the sky so that Orion would always be chased by the scorpion that killed him. Um, so you will find 
that the constellation Orion in the night sky, Scorpio is to the east and the Pleiades are to the west of him. And it's an eternal chase. And um, just so you can see, here's my recreation of La Luna. Play, I plan to insert her in a piece of linen. She's done on a commercially made cotton knotted net. Um, stitched with pearl cotton. The scale is larger than the original, as that is what I was able to get. Um, I, the smallest I can get commercially is uh, seven mesh, and I'm currently working on um, getting better and at my netting so that we can get uh, ten mesh, which is essentially what we need. Now, um, okay, so what else is there to say about this? Um, the final descriptions talk uh, talk about all the little animals that are in the are in the small things. Um, oh, I actually went. Let's go back. There we go. Um, yeah, all the little things the about the little tiles that are in there. It also has um, information on the technique which is darned in two directions and of good quality. The fabric is fine linen, as is the thread. Both of the good quality is slightly twisted. Uh, an ivory white is how it kind of translated out. I probably could have made that a little bit clearer. Um, you know, it's filet lace with floral decoration on the uh, border is what she's talking, you know, she's talking about the border being you know, also fillet lace. The um, the lace has a sign that the spe okay. So she says that um, she says that it's a bed cover because if it was a hanging, only one side would have lace, um, and evidently the bed covers have lace all the way around. Which kind of you know, in my mind, I'm like, well, you don't put the lace on the top, but okay, I'll, I'll trust her. It, it's probably a, uh, a thing that, you know, it may be a cultural difference there. Okay, about uh, five minutes. Okay, well, um, so as you can see, there is the, some information for those who are, um, who can read Spanish. Basically, it's 1.8 uh, meters by 2.1 meters. Um, is there any questions? And a second half of the 16th century. How did they make the mesh? And 10 mesh is 10, 10, 10 blocks to the inch? Yes. Um, here, let me scoochie off of here. Let's, let's um, go back to how did screen sharing is paused. Oh, did you take it back? Nope, nope. Nope, nope. Okay, I'm trying to get back to this. Uh, get out of screen share. Okay, yes, I know you stopped. Okay, good. Um, do you yeah, have sources sorry. for where you bought your materials? You may want to add that to your class notes later on. Yeah. Um, the, sorry, no, the, the jangling was just driving me crazy. Um, the mesh, okay, tin mesh has to be made. Um, basically, this is, there are um, videos of little old uh, Hispanic women going through and um, making, uh, you know, this is this is a tin mesh, okay? These are tin mesh. This is the seven mesh, okay? Um, I've been working on making my own. You use, in order to do this, um, traditionally, it's, it's made like fishnet. If you've ever met, made fishnet, it is essentially made like a fishnet. Um, the fishnet is uh, you know, you are going through, you have a, you have, um, I have a very fine um, gauge. This one is not the one that I'm using for it, but I'm getting a good 10. This one actually gets me the seven pretty well. Um, I don't know where my, I basically took a long doll needle and cut the tips off so that I could make one of these that was small enough. Um, because I actually, when I, I got the triple aught needle, this is a double aught needle. When I got the triple aught needle, it was still too, that's, you know, zero, zero, zero needle. Um, it was still too big for the, the mesh. The mesh is basically, you're working, 
I work this one like you know, you're working, you take your needle through around your um, around your your gauge um, and you just wrap it around and back. There are some lovely um, videos online that you can you can look up to find. I think um, I can post those to the uh, website, um, the SCA Iberia website so that you can see how the net is being made um, and and get a way to make your own net because you're not going to find it small enough for for period. Um, the seven is coming off of a 19th century, <laughs> sorry, I tend to say Victorian, um, a 19th century uh, machine that made the net for them because in the 19th century, women were really big on making um, making their stuff. Um, I bought my net, I bought, um, a, the, the seven net I bought at filet lace at the sea.com. Um, but she sometimes, uh, Rinda Turka. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. Maybe I can find it smaller. Um, I'll have to, I'll have to look that up. 